You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So today on the show, we have uh, something that many people have been requesting for a very, very, very long time. And that is to have two Green Bay Packers superstar podcasters on one show. Well, I, I, I can't do that for you, but I did get me and John Meerdink to talk together on a show, so you can have that. It's the best I can do. Is there a superstar pod? I mean, you know, in the, in the scope of, like, Joe Rogan, no. But anyways, I did want to get him on the show. If you have not listened to the Blue 58 podcast, you don't know what I'm talking about, but go check it out. I think there are um, a lot of similarities between this podcast and his podcast, which is why a lot of people directly recommended him for this show. But anyways, it's a relatively short interview. I'll quit blabbing on. We'll take a break. I don't think there's been any ads recently, so maybe we won't take a break. I don't know. But if there if, if there is a break coming, it'll be around now-ish. So we'll be right back. Probably. Maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, John, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Ryan, it's good to be here. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about, I, I'm actually very curious about this myself, because when I started listening, you were already here. How did you get involved in podcasting? When did you start? And uh, what kind of got this all rolling for you? Sure. So my background, my professional background, though not anymore, is is in radio. So I graduated in 2011 with a degree in broadcasting and electronic media and from there went on to work for a variety of radio stations. And I guess my journey towards podcasting, that sounds really vain when I say it that way. This is not a super serious medium, so don't don't take anything I say as as (laughs) (laughs) uh, overestimating my own importance. But (laughs) my my journey towards podcasting, if I can say it that way, started in 2012. Um, I had a job at a small radio station uh, in South Central Wisconsin and uh, didn't have a ton of friends in the in the town. So I was new to the area and I needed something to do. So I started a, a blog first. And then after toying around with that for a, a year and a half or so, I decided to try a podcast and no one listened to it. It was, it was, it was, it was a <laughs> I, resounding I failure. Feeling. 
<laughs> yeah, it was, so I quit after like 12 episodes or so. Uh, but then in 2016, I launched my current project with a good friend of mine, Gary Zillavy, and uh, wanted podcasting to be a part of it. So just started doing shows and the the audience has grown since then. And I'm pretty happy with where things are now. And we just crossed the 300 episode mark last month, I think. Um, yeah, just after the draft, it was, it was episode number 300. So that's where we are today. And, and, uh, the idea is to just try to try to raise the conversation level around the Packers. The, the thesis is that we can talk about this in a fun way, but also try to help each other, like know a little bit more about the game and cover the Packers in a way that kind of makes sense. Because one of the reasons that I, that I wanted to start writing about and talking about the Packers is I, I saw a lot of people, professionals, who I thought were doing it pretty poorly. There would be beat writers who would lay out an argument and it just wouldn't make any sense. It just wouldn't follow logically. And, and some of my other interests growing up and through college have always been like debate and philosophy and history. And if you want to make good arguments and, and lay out information, it should follow logically and factually. And I wanted to bring that to, to what I do on the on the show and on the on the site. So kind of putting all that together is is why we ended up with the podcast we have today. Well, I couldn't agree with that more, but I do have to correct one thing you said. Everything we do is extremely important. And I, how dare you in two minutes ruin the image of me as being the most important person in all my listeners' lives. So thank you exactly, very much right? for, for ruining that veneer that I've put up. <laughs> but um, hey, all right. Somebody's got to be the most important, so it might as well be us, right? I guess, yeah. No. Um, all right, let's go back to last year a little bit, because everybody knows my thought on absolutely everything, because I talk about it constantly. But I'm curious about what you thought about last year, because there's kind of a weird dynamic where – we won a lot of games, but nobody seems very happy about it. What did you think overall, very broad general question that I'm throwing at you, what did you think overall of the team and kind of what your, well, I guess we'll leave that for the next question. What did you think about last year? So I think I'm kind of of two minds about it. First, I think it's fair to say that the Packers overachieved. Like I think they were probably better than a lot of people thought they would be. Right. And I think they were maybe they maybe ended up with a better back record than they I deserve is not a word that I like to use than than the stats would say that they probably should have. Now, that having been said, it was a lot of fun last year. I really enjoyed the team. There was a lot of great personalities. They did some really good things. And I think they deserved, if we want to use that word again, again, to get as far as they did, because. You can you can have all the national talk radio segments, you know, they're the worst 13 and 3 team ever. But you know what they were? They were 13 and 3 and they were a game away from the NFC champion or from the from the Super Bowl. A couple things break differently. Maybe we're talking about a Packers Chiefs Super Bowl. You you never know. So it was a lot of fun. I think they were maybe in some ways kind of a paper tiger, but so what? They were, they ended up 13 and three and in the NFC championship game, they did a lot of good things and it was fun to watch. What more do you want? And so with that in mind, kind of fast forwarding a little bit now, because I agree, I, I think the team is very close. I just finished recording my podcast. And one of the things I had to keep stressing was they, they weren't a bad team. We, we keep acting like, you know, the defense is terrible and we need to overhaul it and all this. They, they were not a bad team, but so fast forwarding a little bit, with that in mind, what did you think about, we'll, we'll say the acquisitions overall, free agency, although they didn't do as much, as well as the draft, in terms of being able to maybe rectify a few things or getting better in 2019, and then you know we'll kind of get into the specifics of the players, but in general, what did you think about the offseason? So I think for the philosophy that they're trying to put in, the offseason was a good one. I think that if they want to be a run-heavy team that kind of has the size and strength and the athletes to sort of just pummel people into submission, what they did made a lot of sense. You've got a giant wide receiver in Devin Funches. You've got a big, thick running back who's a, a very, to, to put it bluntly, just a plus athlete in A.J. Dillon. 
You've got a, a fullback, H-back, tight end, hybrid guy in Josiah Degara who can do a lot of different things. So from that, if, if that's the philosophy that you want to have, I think they did really well by themselves. You can talk about value and, and where they selected those guys. And ultimately, that doesn't matter if you, if you just get good players. But if, if that's the philosophy that they want to go with, I think they did really well by themselves. Where I struggle is I just don't think that's the philosophy that they need to be building with in 2020. And that kind of just reflects the the pattern league-wide. Passing is more efficient than running. It's an easier way to score points. It's an easier way to get chunk plays. Chances are you're going to get more yards on a passing play than on a running play. If you're trying to run to set up the pass, the data doesn't necessarily support that. If you're just trying to run for the sake of running, that seems like a great philosophy for like 1994. I, I I struggle with it from that aspect, but if, if that's the philosophy that they want to go with, all of their acquisitions lined up really well with that, and it, it might just work work for them if, if that's what they want to do. So with that in mind, let's talk about the one guy that you omitted for obvious reasons. You, Jordan Love is not going to be much of an impact pending any injuries to Aaron Rodgers in 2020, but as much as it's kind of a, a clickbaity thing and we're trying to stay away from it because it's a lot of it is silly. What are your thoughts about Jordan love as a prospect? Number one. And then number two, what, what is your gut feeling in terms of, let's just say he does take over. When would that be in your mind? Well, as much as I, I really want to avoid criticism of the pick from the, this is who he is as a person sort of dimension, because Aaron Rodgers pointed this out in his interview. He, uh, Jordan love didn't get asked to get picked by the Packers. You didn't ask to get put in this situation. So any criticism that I have at the, of the pick is not from, from his sort of wheelhouse or whatever. It's not because of him, but as a prospect, I was fairly low on Jordan love. I can see what they see in him. That you can do a lot of nice things, but I think just the, just the decision overall just doesn't add up for me because of that timeline for Aaron Rodgers. If you, if you're two years away at the earliest, it, it doesn't seem to add up from a cap perspective. It doesn't seem to add up from a resource allocation perspective. It doesn't seem to add up trading up for him. I, I struggle with it in a lot of different ways there. Just as a pure prospect, I think if you're, if you're going to make a bet, he's the sort of guy that, that is worth trying on because you, you have a lot of athletic upside there. When it's on and working for Jordan Love, he looks like he might be one of the better quarterback prospects out there. But I think just the, the holes in his game, the decision-making, I, I struggle with it. And I'm not sure it's the sort of thing that's going to, to benefit or to, to be corrected by sitting for a couple of years. Because it seems like if you're going to correct decision-making, if you're going to correct footwork under pressure, if you're going to correct pocket presence, those things would seem to me to need reps. He needs to be on the field. And with Aaron Rodgers out there, it's, it's going to be a while before that happens. And I think just looking at the cap implications, you've probably done this. It's going to be a couple of years at the earliest, two years at the, at the very, very early end. Uh, if you really wanted to bite the bullet, I think you could get out after the 2021 season and the combined cap hit for love and the dead money from Rodgers would be about what it, what it was just with the the previous year of Rodgers. I don't know for sure, but it's it's going to be a couple of years here, and it it makes me wonder if the Packers are trying to build towards that or trying to win now. It, it, it I, I struggle with it philosophically. Honest question: Have you ever used the phrase Mitch Trubisky while describing Jordan Love? I have not yet, okay. but I see the Darn comparisons. <laughs> I've I've landed more on like Blaine Gabbert, Drew Luck, okay. or Drew Locke, sorry. Um, but uh, I, I can see the Trubisky comparisons too. All right. Well, I just I I feel a little bit bad about it because I didn't know we were going to draft him, and I was hoping I wasn't alone on that. But I guess I'm alone in that. So, all right. So let's look at you. You mentioned moving in the direction of a certain philosophy, and I agree with that. One of the questions that keeps coming up about that is. Should we continue to expect the unexpected in terms of maybe guys leaving that we would never have thought previously? One of the names in particular that I keep hearing that I kept pushing away and pushing away and pushing away, and now it's starting to be a maybe in my mind, is somebody like David Bakhtiari. Another more obvious one would maybe be somebody like Corey Lindsley. Um, do you think there's maybe going to be a continued overhaul of this team to suit the vision of Petten and LaFleur? 
Uh, I think there's a there's a good chance of it, and I'm glad that you brought David Bakhtiari's name up first, so I didn't have to. <laughs> uh, but I I don't know if it will happen, but I think there's a a better than than average chance. Um, just looking, we don't know what the cap situation is going to be like next year. If it stays flat, that affects the Packers' plans. If it goes down, it affects the Packers' plans in a big way because there's a lot of big numbers coming up. So if you just look at Kenny Clark, Corey Lindsley, and David Bakhtiari, Clark is is staying. Uh, if they let him go, Brian Gutekunst should go with him uh, because there's no situation where they should let him walk out the door, either get a deal done or franchise, franchise tag him. So that that is staying. But then you really got to start playing the numbers game. And if you start looking at David Bakhtiari compared to like Josh Sitton and TJ Lang, he'll be going into his age 29 season next year. He's had some back issues. He's, you know, getting to that third contract. There's a lot of pluses on the other side too, but you can at least see a situation where a guy like David Bakhtiari might be headed out the door. I don't think that's what ultimately ends up happening. I think between the two of them, it's going to be Corey Lindsley, but I don't think it's it would be that unexpected. That said, I think if you're letting a David Bakhtiari go or a guy like him, you're kind of just overhauling for the sake of overhauling at that point, because there's no way that you're going to find a guy who is as good or you know, 80% as good as David Bakhtiari, who you wouldn't pay through the nose for in free agency or have to draft highly in the draft. And they, they just haven't done that. So I don't think it's super likely, but it, it, there's a non-zero chance of it happening. So let's shift now to the coming season. And I'll, we'll, we'll start with, and I'll, I'll leave it as a yes or no question because it's kind of a touchy thing, but do you anticipate there being any form of a season this year? Yeah, I think there will be something. I just don't know when it is. So I, I think I, I probably have a, a better grasp on this than than most just because of my current professional situation. I work for a university and we have have to weigh a lot of the same things that the that the NFL or other professional sports leagues do for us to have our daily lives go on as they're supposed to. We have to have people in close proximity to each other for extended periods of time. We have to have a, a certain amount of food service. We have to have just people coming and going in, in close proximity for, like I said, extended periods of time. And we are making plans for that to proceed. I think at some point the NFL or the NBA or whatever is going to come up with a model that works and the other leagues are going to fall in line with that. And I think there's a good chance that that it, that is going to happen at some point. I think the window probably gets moved back a little bit. I'm intrigued by some of the plans that have the season, say, starting in late September or October and then running through the entire month of February. I think that's a model that sort of works. I think you may end up with a possibly a reduced season, say 12 games or 14 games or something like that. But I, I think there is going to be a season. All right. So I agree. So let's let's now that we have agreed that there is a season, let's talk about some of the players that we've got on this team. I want to start off with Rashawn Gary, because a um, lot of different opinions on Rashawn, obviously, athletically, one of the freakiest guys on the entire team, but maybe didn't show up quite as much. We heard from Mike Pettin that we're going to be seeing a lot more of him. What is your expectation of, of Rashawn Gary? Do, are you a believer that he's going to take a step, or are you a little bit more skeptical? Uh, I would call myself, to, to combine the two terms, kind of a skeptical believer. I think All that right. Rashawn Gary has a lot of great tools. Uh, I think one of the things that I was excited about that Petten mentioned was his ability to kick down inside and kind of rush from an, from an interior pass rush sort of sort of place like, uh, like Zadarius Smith does. And I think if you look at Zadarius Smith, you see the sort of path for Rashawn Gary there. A guy who's really big, who has a lot of physical tools, who kind of rushes from all over the formation. So if he can just get on the field and be productive, I think there's there's no reason. Or if he can just get on the field, there's no reason he can't be productive. I am still skeptical as to as to how productive he can be because kind of the story on Gary since he came out of high school was he has all the tools in the world. Just can he put it together? And at a certain point, you just are what you are. Are you are you an athlete or are you a football player? And he hasn't really translated it into being a football player yet. But I'm cautiously optimistic that he can. And uh, I, I I would still put myself pretty firmly in the in the pro Gary camp, despite being skeptical from the moment his name was announced. But uh, I, I am cautiously optimistic. 
So let's kind of take this uh, approach as far as sticking on the defense, but in a little bit more of a broad sense. The defense was kind of like a lot of things with the Packers, kind of an anomaly. If you look at it at a certain time, at a certain angle, it's this is a phenomenal defense, right? We've got you know, Zadarius, who is an elite pass rusher. The corners, depending on situation, were very, very good. W- what is your expectation or desire, I guess, for this defense going forward? Do you think they take a step? Do you think they actually are able to improve, especially against the run, and become a not just a great defense? Because, again, they were great at certain times, but do you think they become a defense that is solid and reliable throughout the season? Or do you think it's going to be more or less the same based on, you know, maybe guys like Gary not taking a step, Kirksey not being an upgrade, whatever. Do you think they're going to get better, or is it going to be more of the same from the Packers' defense? I think they will be better, but I don't hold a lot of hopes that they're going to be a lot better. I think it's clear, like with the offense, what they're trying to do. They want to be a pass defense, pass rushing unit. They want to be defending the pass. And that's clear from their personnel strategy. They spent a lot of money on pass rushers. They spent a lot of draft picks on defensive backs. They're not super concerned with run defense. And Mike Pettin has said that. He said that he's going to stick with his dime-heavy personnel. So he wants to be defending the pass. And if the Packers offense can help them out and put them in situations where they they don't have to defend the run as much, I think that's a philosophy that can work. But if you look at the Packers' losses last year, the offense was not helping them out a whole bunch. And other than the, the Eagles' loss, that was kind of a shootout. It was games where the Packers' offense really sputtered. They got down early, and the other teams can just could just sit on the run and gash the Packers. The 49ers proved that you could do that pretty reliably. And I think if the Packers run into run heavy philosophy teams, it's going to be a problem. But I think that they can improve. And I think with guys like Darnell Savage taking a step, Jair Alexander continuing to improve, if they get more from Rashawn Gary, if Christian Kirksey is uh, is just even a slight athletic upgrade over, over Blake Martinez, I think there can be an improvement there. I don't know if it's going to be a huge step forward, but I think that there is room for improvement. And I know I said a lot of ifs there, but I don't think those are big ifs either. I think Jair Alexander is going to continue to improve. I think Darnell Savage, there's no reason to think he won't. So, I, again, I am cautiously optimistic about the defense improving. The big problem is um, they were unusually healthy last year. And if they get in a situation where Zadarius Smith goes down for three or four games or longer, Preston Smith goes down for three, four games or longer, then the holes get big in a hurry. But that's not something you can control. You just got to hope for the best, as teams do every year. So unlike the the defense, we did invest quite a bit in the offense. Now, it wasn't as much as everybody had hoped. We didn't spend a lot of money on big names and free agency. And then as far as the draft went, you know, instead of getting the, the big name wide receiver, we got a running back, a backup quarterback, et cetera, et cetera. But similar question. I agree with you that there's probably going to be a change in philosophy. Number one, do you think it's going to be a big change? Number two, do you think it's going to have a a very big positive effect for this team, or are you a little bit more skeptical that this isn't going to be a massive increase or whatever? Uh, Let's answer the second part first. I am skeptical that it's going to be tremendously more effective because I think what we saw in limited or well, not, not even so much limited a season worth of exposure last year, we, we saw basically broadly similar output to what we got from Mike McCarthy and Joe Philbin in 2018. So I'm, I'm skeptical that a, continued switch to that philosophy is going to to be a net positive as much as uh, Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers have talked about how great it'll be for them to be in year two of this of this install. I think if you continue to look at it from the overall philosophy perspective, if last year was 75% LaFleur and 25% McCarthy or 60% LaFleur and, and 40% McCarthy. I think we're just going to see more of the of the Lafleur stuff and less of the McCarthy McCarthy stuff. So more play action, more wide zone, uh, more of the the package plays uh, that that involve Aaron Jones as a as a pass catcher. I think we'll just continue to see a trend that direction. I'm not sure that's the right direction to go. Uh, I'm not sure this philosophy is one that's going to work. And and I think we have to kind of remind ourselves that this is not the Sean McVay offense. This is not the Kyle Shanahan offense. This is the Matt LaFleur offense. And it wasn't a spectacular 
points extravaganza in Tennessee, and it wasn't for the Packers last year in Green Bay. So I, I'm skeptical that it's going to be a, a huge step forward. I think it, it may be a small step forward, but I think you are going to see that ongoing shift. I've only got two more for you because I want you to be able to enjoy your family on this holiday. But I want to circle back to the draft just for a second since we're talking about the offense. Give me your thoughts on Dylan and DeGuara because I know there's a lot of not not a lot of excitement about it, but it does fit the scheme a little bit. What are your thoughts in terms of what they can bring? Who are you maybe a little bit more excited about than the other? So let's let's get the negative out of the way right off the bat. Um, I didn't like where they took them. Yeah. Uh, second round pick on a running back and a third round pick on a guy who is, I guess, generously only a tight end in name uh, is is not the direction I would have liked to see them go. And I think I've been clear about that on my podcast. But I, I also want to get past the point where we we talk about okay, these are the bad things about them because I think they both bring a lot of really good things. Let's start with with uh, Dylan. I think if you want to have any kind of conversation about him, you have to start with his athleticism. And he is a, a freakish athlete at his height and weight. And I think there's a lot of good things that you can do with a guy like that. I've gone to the mat for Eddie Lacy many times over the years already. And I think Dylan is just everything that was good about Eddie Lacy in a like superhero style body. I mean, if you just look at his lower body, yeah. it's it's incredible just to look at. He he's kind of a work of art as a running yeah. back. He's 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 amazing to look at. He's fun to watch, and I'm excited about what he can do. I think he's probably going to be a better pass catcher than than we would would anticipate because he's a good enough athlete to figure that out. I think he'll he'll bring a lot of interesting things in the running game. And I think He's he presents a lot of interesting matchup problems because if you put him on the field at the same time as an Aaron Jones, who do you defend? Do you defend Dylan the runner? Do you do you defend Jones the runner? Do you defend Jones the pass catcher? Where do you deploy your resources? That's a that's a big question mark for a lot of defenses. And I think Dagara kind of does the same sort of thing. He gives them a lot of interesting looks that you can throw at the defense. Is he a fullback? Is he a tight end? Is he a big slot receiver? He can he can line up a lot of different places and and we mentioned him on on my show as a potential good fit for the Packers for that reason because the the philosophy under Gutekunst and kind of under Lafleur too is to find guys who can line up in in multiple spots and they they've shown a preference for guys who can do that if you're a receiver you got to be able to line up outside and inside if you're a tight end you better be able to do in line and slot stuff uh, if you look at Danny Vitale what he did for the Packers last year I think we'll see. Degara and probably Jay Sternberger do a lot of similar things. And we even got some of that from Sternberger last year too. So I'm, I'm excited for them as players. I don't love where, where they got them, but that's, that's water under the bridge at this point. What can you do? All right. Final question, but it's a two part question. I kind of cheated a little bit. Um, Number one, what is your expectation for the Packers this year? I know that's kind of a, a vague and lazy question, but I'm, I'm curious anyways what, what it is based on what you've said you expect from this team. But also, maybe more importantly, what would in your mind constitute a good year for the Green Bay Packers? So I think I always like to, to paint expectations in sort of a window sort of philosophy. So you look at where is the the floor and where is the ceiling for the Packers. And I think it's going to be pretty similar to where it was last year. I would put them probably anywhere from 9 and 7 to 11 and 5. I think they're they're good enough that they won't be lower than that and they'll be in contention at 9 and 7, you know, barring unusual circumstances in the NFC, but I think they're they're good enough. They have enough good players that even if things don't go their way in a few games, they're probably going to be in contention no matter what. And I think that's going to be true as long as you have some version of Aaron Rodgers, whatever version of him you're getting on your roster. So that's a that's a good place to be. I think a successful season for the Packers would be uh, at least a playoff berth again. And that's always the the bar for me. You want to get into the playoffs. And, and once you're in, who knows what can happen. So I, I, I think that would be a successful season for them. And I think that's that's probably what we're going to get. Uh, would love to see them win the NFC North so they at least have a home playoff game. But uh, get in the playoffs and see what happens from there. I think that's a, that's a good expectation for any team. Well, I'll, I'll echo what you said at the beginning of this. Part of the reason I got involved, partly because I felt like it might suit some strengths of mine, but part of the reason is I listened to several shows and just thought some of these guys are just not very good at this, and I feel like I could at least be that good. But there were a couple shows 
that I listened to that I really did appreciate and I really thought were were thought provoking and and very very good shows and yours was definitely one of them. Uh, Blue Fifty Eight is the podcast. Um, if I listen to a Packers podcast, that's that's probably going to be the one. So if you're not already listening to it, I would definitely encourage you to go check it out. John does a fantastic job. And John, I just want to say thanks again for uh, for stopping in for a minute. Appreciate it. Thanks for making time. <laughs>